Hey, everybody. Welcome to Question and Answer Time number 33. I'm your host, Adam Neely. I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So let's get started. Adam Emmond writes, How does functional harmony stuff, dominant, subdominant, tonic, etc., apply to modes, specifically Dorian? So, for those of you who don't know what functional harmony is, a good way of understanding what functional harmony is thinking about how, well, words in a sentence are put together. You have, like, nouns, adjectives, and verbs, right? Well, in chord progressions, you also have things like tonics, subdominance, and dominance. And most of the time when we talk about functional harmony, we're thinking about major key or minor key harmony, which have very particular sorts of labels. Now, that's not always going to be the case for all of the modes, because in general, in Western music, we aren't basing harmony off of the modes that often. We do sometimes, but not enough to really have a strong understanding of which label should go where. For example, the five major chord, G in the key of C, has dominant function within typical major and minor key harmony, but that same five chord uh, doesn't really have that sort of feeling that dominantness takes with it when you're doing like a Dorian mode or a Phrygian mode. So one way of understanding chord functions within modes is thinking about something called the characteristic pitch of a particular mode, the note which gives that mode its flavor. And that characteristic pitch is always going to lie on the diatonic tritone. So in the key of C major, the diatonic tritone occurs on the F and the B. In all of the modes of C major, like D Dorian, E Phrygian, F Lydian, G Mixolydian, A Aeolian, and B Locrian, Locrian, I don't know, will have that characteristic pitch of those particular modes on that F and B axis. So D Dorian has the natural six as its characteristic pitch, and natural six in D Dorian is B. E Phrygian has the characteristic pitch of a flat two, which is an F. F Lydian has the characteristic pitch of sharp four, a B. G Mixolydian has the characteristic pitch of a flat seven, which is the F. A Aeolian has the characteristic pitch of flat six, which is also an F. And B Locrian has the characteristic pitch of a flat five, which again is an F. Now the way that we think about functional harmony within these modes is thinking about which chords have that characteristic pitch within a given mode and which chords don't. So for example, in the mode of D Dorian, E minor has the characteristic pitch of B, which is the natural six in the key of D. So it is a characteristic chord to D Dorian. However, F major, the flat three chord in D Dorian, does not have that characteristic pitch of B, and so is not a characteristic chord, so doesn't really encompass the D Dorian-ness of D Dorian. Woo, right out of the gate swinging, a lot of theory. Hope you enjoyed that. Let's get to some more questions. All right. <laughs> Mr. Way writes, The bass is a guitar, and if you think bass solos suck, then I cannot take anything you say seriously. I mean, dude, Victor Wooten, Thundercat? Have you ever listened to music, or do you just like to hear yourself talk about it? Yeah, so I really can't fault you for that one, because after answering that first question, it really does sound like I enjoy hearing myself talk. But, you know, you have to understand that not every bass player is Thundercat, and not every bass player is Victor Wooten, nor is every guitar player Guthrie Govan, or Steve Vai, or Stevie Ray Vaughan, or any of the guitar heroes that you might listen to. We look up to bass heroes and see people that really can pull off these amazing feats and play bass solos, which are very musical striking and very musically rewarding and we think well of course if they do it then all bass solos are like that and that is of course not the case the vast majority of them are not and yes I have listened to music before just so you know Zach Jokey writes in my experience just feel it is what people who don't mind doing things wrong will say frequently there is a lot of truth to that, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, I know that's not a question, and I'm not really answering it, but I'm just sort of posting it up there, because I think a lot of people need to hear that sentiment. Damn Damn Dad Dimson writes, Hey Adam, I'm working on a trio with singer, trombone, drummer, and me on piano. What are your thoughts on having slash not having a bass player? I'm struggling to find an acoustic bass player, and the electric bass players I have are a real pain to work with, and not the sound I'm looking for. What are your thoughts? So, when I was about 14, I attended a master class class with jazz legend Dave Brubeck and also bass player Christian McBride. And that question of, is it necessary to have a bass player came up in the form of, well, which is more important, the bassist or the drummer in a jazz ensemble? This was demonstrated by having a student ensemble play a chorus of the blues. And well, it's actually two choruses. The first chorus was without a drummer and the second chorus was without a bass player. And the first chorus, well, it, it sounded all right, but there wasn't a lot of musical shaping going on because the internal drive of the music was missing because the percussion wasn't there. But 
on that second chorus without the bass player, it sounded like everything just kind of gave out. There was nothing left in the music. There was this cavernous void between the drums over here and the melody and the harmonic instruments over here. And it just didn't feel, it felt completely disconnected. That kind of answered the question in the minds of everybody in attendance, oh, the bass player is the more important one, at least in jazz ensemble. Bass is actually extremely important, who knew? Now there are ways of filling that void where you can actually get away with it, where you can figure out ways of connecting the melodic, melodic and harmonic elements with the percussion, but it's so much easier with a bass player because that's what the instrument is designed to do. It's okay to play without a bass player, but you're going to be sort of fighting the nature of the fact that you have these two disparate elements that haven't figured out a way of finding some cohesion. So just keep that in mind. Mackie Jones writes, what is Berkeley funk? Lol, I've never heard that term before. Yeah, so Berkeley funk, everybody. Uh, yeah, that's a term that I invented, or at least I invented with some of my friends over a couple of beers to, you know, describe something that we were all thinking. A catch-all word to describe the kind of music that comes out of Berkeley with a very particular aesthetic sort of feel. It doesn't have to be funk. It could be jazz. It could be jazz fusion. It could be singer-songwriter music. There's a lot of that. And I suppose by this point, there's also a lot of electronic Berkeley funk out there. But you know, Berkeley has a vested interest in making its students look very good. And the best way that they feel like they can promote their students and thus their own Berkeley brand is creating these very tightly produced, well-edited videos that they put on the Berkeley channel, which have a degree of what we would call shareability so that people on social media feeds will share videos of their students doing crazy, amazing things. And then people will think, oh my God, I want to go to Berkeley to play this music. They are so cool because they look so awesome in this video. And that's great. And that's awesome and good on the students for playing at a high technical level. But at the same time, it's an aesthetic judgment that Berkeley has given them. You see, when you go to music school, you don't really have time to develop your own sort of artistic taste, aesthetic judgment, sense of self, sense of understanding how you might want to use the tools that you are given. And so Berkeley Funk is kind of the placeholder for that. And so I don't really want to share any particular examples. I'm sure that you've seen examples on your social media feeds that I would consider Berkeley Funk. But, you know, after music school, students will have time to breathe and develop their own particular sort of sound and end up sounding more and more like themselves outside of the Berkeley Funk that they got. I know I'm kind of going out really far on a tangent here, but I think I just wanted to explain a little bit more about what I meant by that term Berkeley funk. Paul Mendoza writes, I'm interested about playing salsa on the piano. Do you have any resources for me to learn the musical theory behind it? So the book that I would recommend is called 101 Mantunos, and a mantuno is a particular kind of rhythmic pattern that uh, the piano player will play for salsa music. It fits in particular kinds of claves. I don't really know a whole lot about it, to be 100% honest, but I have checked out this particular book when I've had to play Vivir Mi Vida, the Mark Anthony tune, and a couple other things. I'm not really hip on it. It's a, it's a whole thing, man. So definitely check that out. Q. What audio interface do you use to record your bass? I'm using the Steinberg UR44, which uh, it's pretty good. I like it. I mean, it's an audio interface. Um, the preamps are really good and they're clear, they're clean, no complaints. You know, um, I've also played through like an Apollo rig and the Apollo rigs are awesome, but they're also really expensive. Uh, whatever you go for, you know, make sure that there's a clear, clean preamp in that particular audio interface. Wesley Lau writes, Hey Adam, if there were an instrument that you could learn well enough to perform on right now that you don't already know how to play, what would it be and why? Uh, yeah, so drums, honestly, because, you know, as a bass player, I'm intimately aware of many of the nuances of what drummers are actually doing, but at the same time, I've never really made the physical connection to my limbs in that sort of way. So it seems strange that there's this weird disconnect between the two of them. That's something I definitely want to rectify in the future, but, you know, drums are also kind of a pain to practice because, at least here in New York City, you can't just set up your drum set in your apartment. You have to get a practice space and everything, and, you know, almost on principle, I don't want to learn on an electric kit, but maybe that will happen at some day, at some point. Who knows? Kaylin Austin writes, How do you go about dealing with nerves? I've always struggled with pretty debilitating nerves on stage. My fingers lock up and I can't play a lot of the quick passages in my music. Any tips? I'll answer the question this way. Uh, the fear of the unknown, I feel like, is the true cause of nerves. You don't really know what's going to happen on stage and you don't know whether or not you're going to screw up or not. You don't know whether or not, like, the bass is going to fall. You don't know what bad things are going to happen to you. And, you know, I've been playing for a long time and a lot 
of really crappy things have happened on stage. Bass has fallen, bass is broken, messing up at the completely wrong time, just, just in general crappy gigs. All these bad things have happened to me, and I've come out the other end okay. It's just music, honestly. What's the worst that can happen? Nobody's getting hurt for the most part, nobody's going to get hurt if you play a wrong note. So, you know, also it comes from familiarity. I've been doing it for so long. I do it every couple of days, so I don't really get nervous anymore. I guess breathing exercises help. Maybe a little bit of alcohol might help. Different things will work for different people. But here's the thing. I know what it's like to be nervous. I really do. I experienced true nerves and true anxiety a couple of days ago. I was performing live on national television, actually international television. Uh, the Live with Kelly and Ryan was broadcast simultaneously in Canada and the United States, and I was performing with pop singer Aaron Bowman. And, you know, it was on location. Normally they shoot in New York, I think, but, you know, they were shooting it up in Niagara Falls. And so because it was on location, the television crew was kind of in disarray. And also Justin Trudeau was there. So the Canadian, I guess, Secret Service was running around. And there was all sorts of crazy things happening. The production crew and the stage manager and the audio team were all yelling at us in different languages, French, English. And there's kind of chaos. We didn't know where we were supposed to be at what points. We were walking from the hotel to the site with just minutes to spare because we had to wait for Justin Trudeau and it was like, oh my God, is my bass going to be in tune? Ah, ah, it was just chaos. And I was so, so incredibly nervous during the whole thing because I didn't know what was going to happen. And as soon as we started playing, it was fine because I knew what was going to happen while we were going to play the song and uh, that was fine. And we played the song a bunch of times before, but it was that moment of not knowing that truly caused that anxiety And I think that's an important thing to be thinking about. Robert Schuster writes, I had a choir leader who wouldn't play the devil's chord. (sighs) Well, maybe send them my video. Maybe they'll change their mind. One, two, three, four, Lava King writes, Adam, how do you practice for 6.5 hours without tearing your chops up? I get that you're a pro with a master's, but seriously, that's a shit ton of time. Mad respect, man. Yeah, six and a half hours is a very long time, but you know, we definitely broke it up a lot. We took like a lunch break. We took a bunch of 15 minute breaks and it was a very like laid back sort of environment. So it wasn't as like mind numbing as it might sound. Although I have had some pretty insane, insanely long rehearsals before. I've had days where I've had a total of 11 hours of rehearsal straight, not all the same rehearsal, just kind of like two hours here, then run to the next rehearsal, like four hours there, then run to the next rehearsal. Like I've had those days and that's just kind of what it is. And, you know, uh, coffee helps, honestly, uh, pacing yourself, don't like overdo it, wear ear protection. And, um, yeah, that's just part of the part of the business, man. Part of being a musician. Samuel Wilson writes, Hey Adam, I saw the keyboard player in your band and I thought of some questions. What skills do band keyboard players, like the one in that video, need that differ from classical pianists? I've heard of keyboardists changing the timbre of the instrument to add voices to the piece. How in-depth does that sort of ability go? I would say that the disconnect between classical concert piano and like a rock pop keyboard player is kind of similar to like a, a, an electric bass player to a classical double bass player. Yeah, technically, they're almost the same sort of instrument, but but maybe not even that because the role they fill and what they do is so fundamentally different. Rock or pop keyboard player is much more concerned with sound. So for example, organ playing, a pop rock keyboard player needs to know a pretty decent chunk of what organ playing means, but not classical pipe organ playing, rock, pop, blues, soul, gospel organ playing, which is a very different animal. But not only that, but also sound design, how to create a synthesizer and how to get a good synthesizer sound happening and how that synthesizer will fit within the ensemble. These are things that a classical pianist just, there's no frame of reference for because that's not what they do. They are much more concerned with the touch and technique of a classical acoustic piano. It's a very different instrument. Anthony Valdez writes, Can somebody please tell me who the target audience is for this channel? The target demographic of this channel is myself. And I only just make videos that I know that I would want to watch. And you know, this is why I haven't been chasing trends like making a fidget spinner video or whatever. I just wanna make things that I myself would just like love to check out. I would love to try and like click on that thumbnail over on the side like, oh yeah, I would definitely click on that. That's really the only guiding basis on who I am targeting. Now, if you enjoy my videos, that's awesome. And you know, I have a general idea of who would like my videos. People who are interested in music, people who are interested in bass, people who have like maybe a mathematical bent or like uh, some sort of like philosophical bent, but like also music also. I mean, there's all kinds of overlap there, but 
Um, in terms of the person that I am targeting, it's pretty much just myself. <laughs> Nick Denning writes, The Undertone series does exist in nature. You can produce an Undertone series by holding a piece of paper lightly against a tuning fork. So I did that exact trick in my video called Subharmonic Music. It's basically a way of artificially inducing the undertone series, and it's pretty cool, actually. If you're at all interested in undertones or negative harmony, oh my god, negative harmony, definitely check out that video of subharmonic music. Uh, I think you'll like it. Nicholas Wolf writes, Any chance you could explain where this new neo-soul feel that everyone's using these days? The hi-hat feel is somewhere between swung and straight. Are they using quintuplets? Yeah, they could be using quintuplets. That's one way of doing it. Or septuplets are also literally just dragging notes here and there and just experimenting with how things feel in certain positions, unquantized, completely off of the grid. Quintuplet swing is definitely something that a lot of people are experimenting now with, you know, uh, just figuring out quintuplet subdivisions and trying to make that feel groovy. And I definitely did a video on that subject. Uh, it's actually kind of old, Quintuplet Swing and sequ Sequence Start, which is that song that plays at the end of all of my videos, is in that quintuplet swing sort of feel. Um, yeah, there's a lot of ways of doing it. Uh, I'm not 100% an expert on that style, but you know, it's everywhere. They call it that Jay Dilla thing. And uh, it's fun to mess around with for sure. Paul Hansen writes, Hi Adam, your video work and compositions are fantastic, top notch. I'm a working musician who's a few generations older than you and incredibly impressed with a lot of young players, composers, and YouTube creators who are doing great work right now. As the music industry has changed so much in the last 30 to 35 years, I'd like to know how you see opportunities out there for income streams when both record labels and performance venues are on the downside due to a glut of consumer choices. It's sad to see such talent not get compensated, although YouTube gives exposure. So so there are so many ways that I can answer this question. That eh, becomes kind of difficult to figure out exactly how I'll start, but you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The old model was based upon the idea of a middleman, the record label, and artists had to go through the record label for distribution and also financing for recording. But, you know, the internet came along and home studios came along and all of a sudden artists could go directly to their fans and sell the music directly to the fans for less money. They would be making more money. That did happen in the sense that people could go directly to the fans, but the fans still had to have heard of the people creating the music. And so there became this huge glut. So then the fans demanded a way of discovering new artists. And so instead of going to the record companies and the record labels as the middleman between the artist and the consumers, they now go to the tech companies and do Spotify Discover, Bandcamp Discover, YouTube algorithms feeding you different sorts of music to listen to, Apple Music feeding you different kinds of music to listen to, Tidal, etc. So tech companies now control what you listen to in a sense. So there's always going to be a middleman, so the glut is controlled in some way or another. Now in terms of being compensated for your work, it's like any sort of small business. You will have to work very hard in the beginning. You have to be very shrewd and make smart business decisions. And the first couple of years, maybe three or four years, you probably won't be turning any sort of profit and probably be losing a lot of money as a recording artist. These are just truths that have never changed. It's had the surface level veneer of change, but no, artists have always had to struggle and work very hard in order to see any sort of success. At the end of the day, it is a business and most musicians and creators who are savvy enough to realize that are able to be successful in their particular field. And that realization, that coming to grips with the fact that your career has to be treated with the same degree of rigor and study and acumen as a small businessman or woman, that realization is going to breed success. And that realization is going to lead you in the right sort of mindset to find the opportunities necessary in order to survive and thrive as a creative and as a musician. So, uh, you know, there are a bunch of things that I can, I can say about this. I feel like I'm kind of rambling at this point, but um, yeah, I hope that at least kind of answered your question a little bit. Jay Gore writes, Don't you find that things never really go that smoothly on the bandstand anyways, Adam? For instance, did the guitar player really learn and memorize that 16 bar guitar phrase as accurately, or did he fake it and give a visual or oral cue? Did the drummer verbatim play that drum fill off the top? I doubt it. You know, attention to detail is something that I really truly believe in, uh, not just as an aesthetic goal, but as uh, just sort of a philosophy, because attention to detail gives you reason to do something. Because you know something inside and out and know what makes that thing that thing, you can have a much more meaningful relationship to the music that you're making or the art that you're making or the business that you're running 
or the YouTube videos that you're making or anything that happens in your life, if you put attention to detail in that, you understand it and it makes it worthwhile. And when you just say, ah, it's just a D, E minor, A, or whatever the chords were, uh, you know, uh, there's no point. Why would you do that? And if you are playing with musicians who accept that, uh, don't. Hold them and hold yourself to a higher standard. Because why bother? If you can, why not do that? If you can hold yourself to a high standard, if you have the ability to put in the work, why not do it? Because the rewards are so much more than just half-assing it. I, I don't subscribe to the idea that it's okay to just half-ass it and half-ass anything in music making. And yeah, uh, that that is really what I think it's all about. Uh, commit to it. If you're going to do something, really, truly commit to it. And so that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, You've been watching Question and Answer Time number 33. If you really enjoy what I do here on this channel, please consider joining my Patreon because it's my patrons over at Patreon that allow me to do this week after week. A new video coming out every Monday. And until next time...